Well, hi guys, um, we're in on the foredeck today and we're in the process of working on this forward hatch, just started really, but that's something we're gonna save for, for next time for you. Because this week, I wanna go straight in this week, no nonsense, um, this week's video is all about answering some of your questions and I've got various questions over the last few weeks that, uh, that I thought would be useful to address in a video format. So let's have a go at that. So I've got my book with a few questions written down. Um, yeah, we'll start off here with the ones that I can just do in a spoken form and then we'll wander around the boat and look at various parts. Um, let's start off with a question from Chris and he asked me uh, about mixing up epoxy and if I mix up smaller batches in the summer or in the winter um, and how I deal with that and he's not the only person who's asked me about epoxy. So basically this epoxy that I use I buy from a German supplier called Binker, Boat Service Binker or Boots Service Binker. Um, it's a two to one roughly speaking mix of, of resin to hardener and um, they sell various resins, I use the standard resin, and they sell various hardeners which have different minimum temperature points and different hardening speeds. So in the summer I use what I describe as a summer hardener which has a minimum temperature, temperature of 10 degrees C and in the winter I use the winter hardener which has a minimum temperature of 5 degrees C um, and the hardening speed varies according to that as well. So with the summer hardener, it's not a major problem. Do I mix up smaller batches? No, I don't think I do. Um, I don't think I vary the size of my batches at all. The, the, the trick really is to try to mix up the right amount and that is, is not always easy. You're sort of, you're guesstimating how much epoxy to mix up. Um, but I'm fairly good at it from basically experience. I don't waste much and I sometimes have to go back and mix up a bit more. Uh, but it works out fairly well. The other trick, of course, with epoxy, as I'm sure you all know, is to mix it up in as flat a tray as possible. If, if you've got it in a round tub where it's deep, then it sets off quite quickly. You know, you, you get the smoking mix, it literally smokes and gets hot. But if you mix it up in a flat tray, so it's not too deep, then it keeps a lot longer before it sets off. So um, I've found old ice cream tubs to be particularly useful. That one particular brand of ice cream it is a great tub. I, I kept one tub going for months on end because it had enough flexibility in it that I could pop the old hardened epoxy out of it, uh, you know, and then and, and come out clean and, and I used it again. But sadly, that tub just broke, so I shall have to buy some more ice cream. The next question, and this is one I've been asked a lot over the last couple of years. Why do I use, let's see if I can credit somebody for this question, shall I? Uh, no, I, I might have been Russell with this question. Why do I use nails sometimes and screws other times? And that's simply answered. If we're talking about the planking, the plywood planking, simply answered in that if I'm using a screw in the plywood planking, I take it out again afterwards. <coughs> All of the plywood planking is fixed together with bronze, silicon bronze ring nails, grip fast ring nails. Um, they grip virtually as good as screws. They're easy to put in with a hammer. Okay, they bend sometimes, but, but most of them go in smoothly. Uh, cheaper than bronze screws. And, and all of my underwater fixings are, are silicon bronze. I haven't mixed metals at all because that's an important consideration. Um, you know, keeping or avoiding electrolysis underwater. Now of course all of those fixings are sealed over with epoxy so it may not have been an issue and I have been thinking recently that if I built another boat I might go for galvanized screws. Um, I'm not going to build another boat I don't think but, but this is I've been reading the, um, the story of Alan Farrell's boats recently. Great book called Salt on the Wind, um, the sailing story of Alan Sherry Farrell. He bought loads, he built loads of boats and he used galvanized screws throughout and, and I think I might be tempted to go galvanized screws if I did it again, but I haven't. I've used silicon bronze throughout underwater. If it's significantly above the waterline, I've been happy enough to use a bit of stainless. But that's the answer. So in the planking, any screws I used anywhere were, were just to pull the planking together while the glue dried, and then as soon as the glue was dry, I took them out again. 
There are none left in the planking. On occasions, and pieces where I really wanted a bit more security, such as down the stem, I used some silicon bronze screws, stem and the stern post actually, silicon bronze screws. Um, but most of the fixings are the, are the grip fast ring nails, silicon bronze, and screws were taken out. If it's above the waterline, where it's not really a particularly wet situation, I'm fairly relaxed about using stainless. I've well, Jeffrey asked me how I've found working with the Black Locust, and, and as you've seen in previous videos, I've done the tow rails in the Black Locust, I've done these deck stringers in the Black Locust, I've done the, the rubbing straight base in the Black Locust, and I bought it rough sawn, um, you know, just, just planks cut out of, out of a tree, two inch, five centimeter thick, and as you've seen, I, I milled it on my very cheap table saw. I bought a new blade for that. You know all of that. How have I found working with it? I found it to be delightful. It cuts easily, it planes easily. It, it's, where I did some, some chiseling work on it, it cut easily, it shapes easily, it sands easily. I think it's great. Uh, I have no idea why it isn't very, very popular as a boat building wood. Yeah, I'm sure it's getting more popular. But it's, it's brilliant. Highly recommended. Antonio asked me when I'm going to paint, and, and it's a fairly difficult question to answer. It depends on progress. But um, I mentioned last week, I think, that putting this trim around, the Black Locust trim around, is, is dividing up into panels. Once I've got the trim on the, the ball at tops there, then the panels will be ready, and then we'll be getting on with, with epoxy. I've got trim to go along the, the forward and aft end of the raised deck. For the final trims on that and then we'll get, be getting on with epoxy primer that's what i meant to say epoxy primer and then when i put the final top coat on i don't know but i, I do anticipate getting it primed this autumn that's that one canute asked me why are the windows so small well, that's a bit of a philosophical one well i've got the big deck deck hatch up on the top there and the sliding hatch will be fairly big and, and transparent but I guess you're talking about these ports. And um, this is my theories on cruising sailboats, basically speaking. The smaller the windows, the less dangerous they are, the more seaworthy worthy the boat is, because a big window area is easy for a breaking sea to, to, to break in. And I believe, it's my thinking, and I'm not, not only mine, I'm certain of that, but I believe that small ports are seaworthiness. So that's the way I go. Inside will be painted out white, which will lighten her up significantly. At the moment, it's, it's largely wood coloured. So when she's painted out you know, fully white, then, then she'll be a lot brighter in there. And I shall put LED lights in there, which I'll use as and when. But um, also hope to be in sa sailing in sunny climes. So hopefully she'll be bright enough. And she will be bright enough. I know, again, to mention Miss Molly, from earlier, you know, I've, I've done nothing different. She was had the same, actually exactly the same ports in and the same number of ports and didn't have the deck hatch and it was fine. Then while we're here, I'll just deal with this quick question from Mac who asked me what type of glue I use. And I use two, two types of glue, um, which I've been fairly open about, I think. Um, between, if it's wood on wood between the ply panels, I use uh, Kalano Semperoc. It's a foaming PU glue, waterproof. Um, you'll see if you do a search on the, on the web, you'll see various boat builders are using it in, in different situations. I've been happy with it, but of course the big test will be when we get in the water and how she performs over time. Um, and everything else is glued with epoxy. As I said earlier, being a epoxy is the one I use, a two to one, roughly speaking, mix ratio. And uh, yeah. So Mark asked me about the, about the sliding hatch. Um, is there going to be glass in it? And also a couple of other comments last week made me made it clear that the, the, my description of how the sliding hatch works obviously wasn't clear enough. People hadn't got it. So glass in the sliding hatch. Well, not glass, but transparent plastic. Yes, most certainly. Um, good, thick, solid, transparent plastic. Um, sliding hatch, let's just do with that. The, the forward half of this hatch opening will have a fixed cover on it that doesn't move with the transparent plastic in the top letting light through. The aft half 
will be the sliding section that slides up under that cover part, also with the transparent plastic in it, letting light through. So the sliding part is only half of this opening, which is how the whole thing functions. Again, keeping the opening hatch as small as possible for seaworthiness. I know a lot of builders of these boats don't put sliding hatches in at all. They have different ways of getting in. Um, and have uh, people like these domes and things. I'm, I'm not a big fan. Small hide it sliding hatch with, with the regular washboards. That's what I'm doing. Good. A couple of people asked about the old drill fill drill thinking. One, one of you described it as a mantra. One of those people was Garrick, certainly, uh, who asks a lot of probing and very good questions. Um, which get me thinking. Thank you, Garrick. Uh, drill, fill, drill. Yeah. My thoughts. You may not agree. I think it's overkill. Plain and simple. I'll tell you why. I have worked on two boats that had been around for decades and had significant portions of plywood in them, both of which were fur ply from the west coast of the US. One of these boats had circumnavigated. It uh, is Vela, I can name the boat Vela. It's the subject of the book Around the World with Duct Tape and Bailing Wire or something of that ilk by Wendy, I can't remember her name, look it up. Anyhow, I did some maintenance work on that boat. Um, and the decks were plywood and they weren't epoxied. They were covered with aero ball covering, a cloth cover covering with aero ball. Um, and in places there had been some water ingress into that plywood and there was no issue with the decks. They were fine. The plywood was fine. Um, my own cruising boat, which I've now mentioned twice before, this is the third mention, Miss Molly, built in, oh, I'll have to look that up, late 70s, I believe. Um, been around for 25 years when I bought her. She'd been out on a mooring on, uh, off of Vancouver Island, which isn't the driest environment in the world. Again, the plywood coach roof was not epoxied. It was covered with a cloth. I don't know what resin was used. Um, not epoxy though. No issue at all. The deck rails were screwed, were, were, were galvanized, bolted through the deck. Uh, no drill fill drill. Just bolted through with a bit of sealant. No problem at all. These boats, both of these boats have been in significant weather. None, neither of them had drill fill drill. Neither of them had any issues with the plywood. So we're, this is my, only my opinion and you may hate it, but I think we're in danger of overkill. I think we're in danger of trying to build perfection. And I'm sure drill fill drill is better. But how long are we trying to build these boats to last for? I'm 58 years old. If my boat lasts for another 25 years, I'll be 83. Am I going to be sailing when I'm 83? Phew, maybe if I'm lucky. If this boat lasts another 30 years, that's me done, isn't it? I'm not building this for future generations. I'm not building it to sell it. I'm building it for me to have a laugh with. Um, and on the Junk Rig Association recently, there's, there's been a quote going around on, in the forum. Um, and I'll try to get that quote right. It is, obsession with perfection has made many a good anchor. And there's something worth thinking about. You, know, you want to get your job done, you want to get the boat done, and you want to get it in the water. Of course you're trying to build it well, of course you are, but, but we can get carried away. And my experience, and you know, I have experience of maintaining other people's boats, shows that drill, fill, drill. It's not necessary. That's my thoughts. You may disagree. A couple of quick ones before, before we get to the, uh, the keel question, which is the most important one probably. Um, let's have a look what we've got here. Norman and Gary both asked, when will we, will be moving, when will we be moving from the shed to outside there? Again, I don't know. Depends how progress is. 
Um, I anticipate fitting the inside out this winter and possibly the middle of next summer pulling her out. Possibly. It depends on how we get on. There are so many little things to do that you don't think about. That, that I won't pull her out until she's ready to be pulled out. And I've done everything that I can with her in the shed. Even though I know it makes these videos a bit limited because we haven't got room to get a lovely boat shot. But nonetheless, it just makes total sense to do everything possible in the shed before she's pulled out. And middle of next summer, this time next year, possibly. Don't hold me to it. Next question. Um, <laughs> fun one from Mike. What is it about the sea? What is it about the sea that makes you do this? It is, I say, a very good question. Um, yeah, perhaps I can answer it easily. Of course, I don't really know. But um, if you've ever been cruising, spent a bit of time cruising in a sailboat, you'll know it's a delightful pastime. And uh, now I'm at that stage in life where the kids are grown up, um, well, I'd like to get back to it. And not only is it delightful and mainly relaxing, I'll come back to that one, but it's also environmentally friendly, no doubt. It's, I think um, it's one of the most environmentally friendly ways there are to live, and, and that to me is important. Any kind of small home thing is a good way to go, and, and a boat certainly counts as a small home and uh, if it's low tech can be very environmentally friendly come back to relaxing mainly relaxing can be extremely relaxing which is delightful can be low stress but of course moving a sailboat from a to b can be quite the opposite it depends on on you know the weather there are two extremes which we've experienced both of storm not relaxing at all <laughs> quite stressful and Absolutely no wind when you're trying to do significant distance. Also not particularly relaxing. And, and that's one of the challenges I want to rise to. I'll be happy if we avoid storms, but getting used to the challenge of getting places in very light airs. Because in the past I've been rather frustrated with that and, and I, I want to challenge myself on that front. Yeah. So that's the answer, Mike live in an environmentally friendly manner and challenge myself and relax. So I've saved this question for last. It's a question I do get asked about a lot and the question of the keel for the boat. And Russell asked about how the keel is fixed to the boat, how the loads are spread. I've had lots of various questions about the keel for the boat. Because as I've said a few times in these videos, one of the beauties of these boats is that you put the keel on last, which means you can keep the boat low in the shed and at the end, get her up in the air somehow, put the keel underneath. So these boats come with two options for keels. You've got a fin keel option, which is concrete, scrap iron, easy to make. It's, it's basically ferro cement, although it's filled solid but you do it in the old ferrous mint style with a few layers of fine mesh over, over a rebar armature. Um, and then you chuck some scrap iron in there and some concrete um, and build up your fin kill. Out the top of it are long bolts that, that stick out that are welded to that metalwork in the concrete kill. Um, and those bolts come up through these floor beams that you can see here. Um, I don't know the dimensions of the keel. It's not particularly big, but it gives you a draft of, I think, four foot six, or set about one and a half meters ballpark. Um, and I am going to put the long keel on her. Um, the long keel, I believe, in the plans is designed to be lead, although it's not clear. If you look at Mr. Benford's website, his Dory's website, so his, his um, Benford US Dory's, I believe, is the website. I'll, I'll put a link up. Look at that. You can read the bit about the keels, and it's not. It's a little bit ambiguous. If it's if there's an option for a concrete and scrap iron long keel or not, it's not 100% clear. Um, but I'm going to try to build a concrete and scrap iron long keel. Now the long keel 
gives you a shallower draft, three foot six, which is just over a meter. Um, it has some layers of dug fur fixed to the bottom of the boat. The length of the length of the bottom of the boat almost, well, from, from where the, the stem comes down, from that point to just forward of where the sail drive leg comes through, there's a long piece of dug fur fitted to there. That dug fur is at least 15 centimeters, six inches wide, and the local woodyard here has 16 centimeters wide dug fur. I should be using that, it'll be 16 centimeters wide. Okay, you build up several layers of that, four layers or so of that, two inches thick each, each piece, and the stem line comes down at an angle. So you don't continue the stem line, it comes down at more of an angle. <coughs> And then, so those are laminated up under the boat. That gives a really strong spine down the middle of the boat. Uh, those would be simply epoxy glued, a few bronze screws to hold them in place to the bottom of the boat. Then my plan is to, is to make up a steel box. And if you look at on my website and the builders section, I, I've linked to a boat that was built by uh, Jerry Limber, I believe it is. Uh, the boat barn, certainly. And if you look at the way he did his kill, that's my plan. Make up a steel box, fill that with concrete, scrap iron, I've got a bit of lead, um, to get the, the, the weight that we need. Um, and then that, like the fin kill, has bolts that protrude out the top of it, welded in there. They come up through these floor beams, you just drill some, some holes through the floor beams. These floor beams are one every 18 inches or so, roughly. Um, and it bolts up, two bolts, through the floor beams. And remember that these floor beams are sat on top of three layers of 10 millimeter plywood. So we've got 30 mil plywood under there. So we've got significant load carrying capability. Um, and that's the way it goes. And especially also with that dug fur spine down the middle, that will spread the loads beautifully and she'll be good. And hopefully nice and shallow draft. That's the kill plans. Okay, that's it for this week. Um, just a little, little bit to say before we go, and that is um, next week there won't be a, a video. Um, we're taking a little break, um, but we'll be back the week after that. Um, showing you getting back to boat building. Certainly this, this forward hatch will be a feature. Um, thanks for watching and give us the old what's ever. I hope I've answered your question. If, if you've got other questions, please send them in. I'll be happy to answer them. Good. See you soon. Bye. Seems